and just thank God for this opportunity and know that you know all of the things that make this uh, gathering atypical, the distance, the mass, all those things are ways that we're showing love and care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So thank you so much for that. It's just a great time to be together when we move into fall and see all the changes that take place, you know. Um, the hymn goes, summer and winter and springtime and harvest. As thou has been, thou ever shall be. And that's still true. The nature doesn't know the difference. It's going to give us a beautiful display of wonderful colored leaves. And we'll just see how this moves on and, and, and just pray for uh, all of this to be resolved in a way that keeps people as safe as possible. A couple of announcements I'd like to lift this morning. Uh, Crop Walk is next week. And some of you have been very... Uh, generous in supporting uh, my walk and I'm appreciating that because the money goes all over the world for food, clean water, just all sorts of places. But the miracle of Crop Walk is a portion of it all also comes back to this community. If this community raises money, then this community gets money to help support its hunger ministries. So we can be thankful for that. I know specifically that the food pantry in Hesperia uh, last year got something like $4,000 from Crop Walk. Isn't that amazing? So you're helping people next door and people on the other side of the world. And we also are still supporting hand-to-hand -hand for kids uh, to take home a backpack full of food for the weekend. Some kids, their nutrition in a day is what they get at school. And of course, then on the weekend when there isn't school, they need some help. So it's really a wonderful program. You see up there what we're hoping that this church can provide. And we appreciate in advance that you'll participate in that ministry. Let's take a moment now to set our hearts and set our minds and think about God's goodness in our life as we listen to uh, the wonderful crowd you've prepared.
join me with me in the call to worship. God blesses us with answers to our prayers. God challenges us to be answers to prayer. God gathers us in this hour of prayer. circumstances right now in your lives that may seem uh, helpless and hopeless, God is already at work and we will see those results as the days come. So if you want to take a moment here with me, we'll spend a moment in silence and then continue in prayer. And in the silence you can lift all of those who are on your heart, who needs God's presence and God's touch more than ever. Let us pray. Enough for us all. Out of your caring compassion for us, you invite us to come away with you to a place of rest and quiet. Help us to say yes to your invitation and then sit at your feet and listen to your word. Out of your compassion, you care for those who are harassed, helpless, lost, lonely or afflicted. 
Sometimes we feel that way ourselves. So hear us as we pray for those that you love. Hear us as we celebrate also those who have joy unbounding in their lives. Help them to know that all good gifts come from you. Lord, in your compassion, teach us to follow you, to trust you, to love you, and to love as you love. Lord, feed all who need you, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Heal us in the places where we need to be healed. And then teach us, O oh Lord, to have compassion for others as you do. Help us to show compassion in action the way you did. And then remind us when it comes time to come away with you again for rest and quiet and the time to look to you for our strength. Lord, in your mercy, have compassion for us as we pray in the way that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'll be reading today from the Gospels, again, the story of Jesus and Jesus' life from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In this story from Scripture, we find a, maybe a familiar scene for any of you who have brothers or sisters, or any of you who have more than one child. In this story, we find Jesus dealing with a sisterly squabble. A sibling spat, whatever you want to call it, it happens through the generations. And we're dealing with that. And as someone, myself, who grew up with four sisters and a few brothers besides, I'm the seventh of nine kids, uh, I've seen more than one sibling spat, I can tell you that much. And I never caused any of them. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I gotta be more careful about my truthfulness. In the house of God. Um, but in my experience, these types of arguments are usually in some way or another connected to who should be first or who should have most or who is the best. And these sibling issues hit hard and fast and then they usually blow over before you know it. They're never long lasting. And so many savvy, level headed parents know the best way to deal with a Sibling spat. Did you know I only have one child? Let's think about why for just a minute. Um, the best way to deal with a sibling spat is not to deal with it at all. Keep out of it. Unless, of course, someone is really getting out of hand or someone is at risk or if there's a possibility to teach one of those lasting lessons that we try to teach children. So why is Jesus involved? Why didn't he 
you get involved in the story of Mary and Martha and their sisterly squabble over who is the best, who is right, who is doing the right thing. It seems a little bit silly and trivial, doesn't it? For all the things that Jesus had to deal with, that he got involved with this. Why is the story in Scripture in the first place? And why is it that Jesus doesn't have the sense to just stay out of it and let it blow over? Jesus gets involved in this issue, though. He gets involved in this issue because, like parents, at their very best, Jesus can see that someone is getting out of hand. And there's a possibility of teaching a lasting lesson, and someone is at risk. Let's start with who's getting out of hand. Experience tells me that in situations like this, it's not always obvious who's out of hand. I just want to take a moment to tell you about my little sister, Connie. Um, speaking of sisterly spats. And she's become a fine woman and a loving mother and we're true <coughs> friends today. But when I was young and she was younger, she was very skilled, very skilled at making every dispute look like it was my fault. <laughs> Maybe you had something like that in your family. Uh, she would get into my things and shirk her share of the chores. We had to share a room and she never straightened her side of the room and tease and taunt and basically behave like a brat. But when I reached my boiling point and made a fuss about it, she would put on that ever so innocent face and bat those baby blue eyes and conjure up a tear or two. And she was the baby of the family. Are there babies of the family here? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. There's usually a little bit more slip there in the rules for babies of the family. Uh, so obviously any ob observer would believe that I was the one getting out of hand. Some of you may look at this story as my parents looked at my sister and myself. Some of you may look at this story of Mary and Martha and immediately assume that because Mary isn't saying anything, she's just sitting there at Jesus' feet innocently, that it must be Martha. Martha must be the sister who is getting out of hand. After all, Martha's making all the noise, isn't she? Mary hasn't said a word. She's complaining, she's blaming, she's trying her best to win Jesus' favor. And when you stop and think about it, she appears to be doing just that. She appears to be doing just what she should be doing. Think for a moment about Jesus' teaching. Jesus tells us to welcome others, right? Martha's doing that. Jesus tells us to serve others. Martha's doing that. Jesus tells us to go and to do and to act. And Martha, she's doing all of that. Our text tells us that, that Martha is working at many tasks and believes that all of this work would make Jesus very proud. So I can understand Martha's confusion here. I can see why she is upset. But to be fair, we also have to take a look at Mary for a minute. She looks innocent enough, right? The text says she's sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him. That can't be too bad, can it? Sounds right to me. But Martha doesn't see it that way. Martha sees Mary sitting there doing nothing, and she wonders why Jesus doesn't know that Mary has it all wrong. She wonders why Jesus doesn't seem to care about Mary's lack of action. Rather than being proud of her, Jesus actually seems disappointed in Martha, though she's doing everything. Martha wonders why Jesus doesn't press Mary into service and make her get up off her pillow and help out with all the very important tasks that Martha is doing. Instead, Jesus seizes that opportunity to teach a lasting lesson. He tells Martha that Mary has chosen the better part. Yeah, I can see why Martha would be confused. I'm a little confused myself. I know that Jesus calls us to preach and teach and, and, and make, you know, make disciples uh, do all of these many, many tasks. Those are all in what I'm expected to do as a person who accepted the call of ministry. And yet Jesus is telling Mary that the better part is to sit at his feet and listen to him. 
But I refuse to pronounce Martha wrong in her action. Martha is not wrong. She's just confused. Martha is confused because she knows that Mary is not so innocent as she first appears. Martha knows that if we are all like Mary, think about that for a minute, if we are all like Mary, sitting and listening, instead of going and doing, who would organize the church for mission? Who would feed the hungry? Who would teach the good news to those who seek it? Who would do all of the things that we're called to do as disciples if everybody followed Mary's example? Both Mary and Martha had welcomed Jesus into their lives, but they chose to respond to his presence in their lives in very different ways. Mary may not be making a fuss, but her choice seems to put her at serious risk of settling for an inactive faith. If you know people like that, she wants to settle for an inactive faith. Martha, on the other hand, is distracted by her many tasks. I find it interesting because they use the word distracted in the NRSV that we read from, and it actually is more literally translated from the Greek as being dragged around. Dragged around. Martha is being dragged around by her many tasks. And the risk for Martha is the risk of settling for a life of unfaithful action. You know people who just do and do and do and do and do, and they never stop to think about why. We have Mary with her inactive faith. We have Martha with her unfaithful action. But we also have Jesus saying that Mary has chosen the better part. But Jesus is not saying that Mary is innocent of any wrongdoing. Notice that one little word. Notice that one little word that Jesus says, the word part. The better part. If something is only part, that would imply that something needs to be added to make it whole. Jesus is not saying that Mary is right and Martha is wrong. Jesus is telling these sisters that neither of them has it all right. Only partially right. Mary has chosen the better part only because she is starting in the right place, sitting and listening to Jesus. And though Martha is right in her efforts to welcome and actively serve Jesus, she has put her service before the sitting and the listening. For either of these sisters' faith to become whole, they need to do both. I often need to remind myself that, you know, Reading scripture just for sermon preparation is, is not enough. Sometimes you just have to read it. Read it for the joy of it. Read it to learn more about those uh, times of faith and the people of God. Jesus intervened in, the, intervened in the sibling step because both of these sisters, these two disciples of Jesus, were at risk of enjoying only part of what Jesus has to offer. Make no mistake about it. We share that risk. We today, in this room, share that risk. So it is good to be reminded that Jesus does not want our empty busyness or our unfaithful action. Nor does Jesus want us to simply claim his presence and then live an inactive faith. If we truly long to welcome Jesus into our lives, into our hearts, into our homes, we have to take both Mary's part and Martha's part. Neither is enough on its own. And we need to find balance in our lives of faith. When we combine our times of resting in Jesus' presence with our times of acting on Jesus' behalf and serving the Lord willingly, our faith and our discipleship can become whole. So Jesus' lasting lesson in this text amounts to this. To the Marthas, maybe you feel like you're a Martha. To the Marthas who are feeling somewhat dragged around by your many tasks, take time in your active faith to feed your spirit and to listen to Jesus' direction for you and for your ministry. And you will be made whole. And to the Marys who have enjoyed Jesus' presence and fueled yourself 
with the better part. Well, it's time. Time to get up off your pillow and find a ministry that fulfills Jesus' commandments to go and do and serve. And you too will be made whole. Because when it comes to living as disciples of Jesus Christ, let's not settle for the better part. Let's seek to be whole. Let's seek to be holy disciples in Christ's holy purpose so that his kingdom will indeed come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the example that we find in scriptures of people just like us trying to sort out the best way to serve you. And we ask that you open our minds, open our hearts, open our spirits, open our willingness to be able to be wholly yours. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
as you go forth into your lives and into this week, work to be whole. Work to be folks who rest and lean and think on Jesus and Jesus' teaching in the Word, in prayer, renew yourself. But once you feel that power that Jesus brings, that's the time to roll up your sleeves and go and work on behalf of Jesus. Go forth as those who know the love and the peace of Jesus Christ. Amen.